This is America. Don't got you slipping up. Look how I'm living up. Police be tripping up. Yeah, this is America. Guns in my area. I got the strap. Congratulations. Thank you so much for joining us, Marcy Mistret, right? That's correct. Perfect. We just wanted to start out by asking, of course, uh, you are the head of the Campaign for Youth Justice, and we can't wait to hear all about um, that campaign and um, the mission and the goals and what you've achieved so far. Um, but before that, how did you get involved with working to reform the justice system specifically for the youth? Um, this has been a calling of mine since I was probably in high school. Um, I did a couple of, you know, shadow days and really felt a calling to both the um, racial and social justice issues that were really paramount. When I went to graduate school, it was in the 1990s. So that's when all of this laws and rhetoric around young people uh, being treated as if they were adults started um, and I happened to be in Chicago and that was really an epicenter for a lot of this so it it was just so profoundly wrong that it really called to me so I was really fortunate to be able to be a social work student placed in a legal clinic and to be able to work with lawyers on some of these individual cases Wow that's really that's really incredible um, so what do you think today is the biggest issue facing uh, youth in the justice system? So in the 90s, one of the things that we did was to basically say the only tool in the toolbox is to incarcerate children. And our numbers went up so, so high. I think there's been a lot of research and findings and out, you know, and think, uh, understanding about how kids develop. Um, that has moved the field to treating many children who really have high needs, but maybe haven't, um, don't show high risk for public safety to get treated in their community with, with much better results. Like we have, we have very clearly established that incarceration is a criminal, you know, criminogenic factor, right? So pretty much if, if you lock a kid up, you are increasing their chances of being locked up again. So I think we've adjusted the, you know, the continuum in a right way. I think what we haven't really struggled with, and this is a long way to get to the answer to your question, but I think what we haven't yet reconciled is when children do engage in violence, what is the appropriate response? Our, our response is still the, the same hammer on the same nail. And a lot of that means we're treating them as adults. We're taking away their childhood. Um, and it is falling so heavily on children, um, particularly black boys, but children from urban areas who we know have very high exposure to trauma and violence in their own communities. And so instead of, we still have not reconciled that. How do we deal with trauma without a carceral response? So I would say that's the biggest nut we still have to crack. Um, though in saying that, I'm also recognizing that that is a very small percent of the population of young people who we continue to arrest. So even though our arrest rates have fallen to the lowest point in 50 years, it is still, most of the kids who are locked up are still kids with misdemeanors, low level offenses, or, or technical violations of probation. So, you know, we still got to squeeze down, but we really have to, we really have to reckon with what happens when somebody physically harms or injures or kills another person. But you'd say that a majority of the cases that are that are represented in our juvenile justice system are not violent. It's not violent crime. Children do not, are not the drivers of violent crime in this country. They never have been. They are much more likely to be victimized by crime or self-injure as a result of being injured than to per perpetrate crime, mm. right? Yeah. So I guess the a lot of what still needs to happen is that reframe in the media and in kind of the shift. I think, you know, the American public from victims to conservatives to liberal folks have all agreed that they want rehabilitation. All polling has been consistent for at least 20 years. They want rehabilitation for kids. Um, they do, people believe that children can change. Um, but we have not followed that with dollars <laughs> or practice enough. A lot of these kids are exposed to trauma 
as children. They're exposed to trauma in their own communities. Um, are there any other social determinants or psychosocial factors that can drive drive to juvenile court involvement? And I mean, I think for one, we can we can say um, crime maybe in one's community, like the crime that they observe. Would that yeah. be a fair statement? I I think, you know, we hear from kids who are in the very deep end of the system. It would have never occurred to me to put a gun in somebody's face till somebody did that to me. Hmm. Right. So that's what I'm talking about victimization. I think family violence is a big piece of it. Again, our only, we have not evolved in our, we have evolved a little bit in our solutions to family violence, but we really haven't approached it with a trauma lens. We know, um, we know the stress that happens on families when there's family when there's family violence, whether that's between two adults or between children and adults. And we've got to figure out a way. Our our response has still been removal. It's either removal of the mother, the the children from the parents. It's a removal of the of one of the two adults from each other. It's the removal of a of a kid because of a fight with a parent or a grandparent. We're still you operating from the removal approach and i think what we have to do is figure out i mean you want people to be safe so maybe that removal is temporary till till tempers go down and you can kind of really get to the structural pieces but we need a systemic response and we're still doing individual responses and that's not going to move the needle right. you know and of course when you put race um when you put race racism and structural racism and white supremacy under all of that it just exacerbates things to the nth degree we i mean our courts really do not believe that black families can take care of their children hmm. how do you think that the the goals of the current racial justice protests tie into the need for reforming the education system and where that plays a role in the school to prison pipeline so I think the folks in the, in the school justice reform movement have had that racial justice lens for a long time, mm -hmm. right? We, we have known that there, and actually the, um, there was just a statement recently that came out that said the rescinded, like there is no correlation <laughs> between school resource officers and safety. So basically where school shootings happen, where these kind of like, big mass shootings happen that get the news and the front page news are not in the same places where we place school re resource officers. So those are generally white, suburban, rural, maybe still disconnected young people because, you know, either again, unaddressed trauma, mental, unaddressed mental health, unaddressed access, too many access to guns, all of those pieces together. Um, but where the resource officers and policing of young people happens is in, often fall, ends up being in urban areas um, that are mostly kids of color. So I feel like that analysis has been there for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I think what you're seeing, you know, and Black Lives Matter has been around for a near, I mean, we're getting closer to the decade to the non than the non-decade side of things. Um, and people are just now understanding that it's a real thing. So I wanna I wanna talk about uh, the campaign for youth justice. And um, I really want to hear about how um, or I should say why the campaign was founded and what is the mission, what was the mission at the founding and what is the mission today? So it hasn't changed over 15 years. Um, I would say we got clearer on kind of, as data and research came out, we got clearer on, on ways to kind of move the needle quicker. Um, but our mission has always been um, to end the prosecution, sentencing, and incarceration of youth under 18 in the adult criminal justice system. And that's still true, right? Um, I think where there is nuance now is, is 18 enough right? Adolescent development and brain research has said actually you can be pushing up to age 24, 25 in that. Um, we have been very clear that you got to start with the under 18s and then we can move to this more emerging adult um, section. But I think that that's a reckoning for folks. And I think we've started to see, you know, Vermont raised the age to 20 for many, you know, many charges. Um, and there is an expansion of kind of this emerging adult justice investments. So that, that shifted a little bit. Um, 
but we have been very, very clear that the age of criminal responsibility needs to, at a minimum, be 18, that children cannot be housed in adult jails or prisons, mm -hmm. and that um, kids, to send a child to the adult system is so serious that there needs to be judicial review in a, in a, you know, with a full hearing where kids have representation before they get moved to the adult system. We, there's no place for automatic transfer. Um, and those, those really haven't shifted. Right. I think what's shifted is the buy-in, the research, the validators of that approach um, has shifted <laughs> to be much more a broader, a broader uh, tent, if you will. Right. So what were your initial goals for the organization and where are you now today, 15 years later, in reaching those goals? Mm -hmm. So I would say that the numbers have dropped. It was estimated when we opened that there was 250,000 children a year that were charged as adults. Um, that number has dropped. The most recent national numbers we have was from 2015, and that was 76,000. Um, we're pretty sure at the end of by the end of 2020 that will be halved again to under 40,000 um, children because of the Raise the Age initiatives, um, and then that will continue to fall. Uh, children who are um, transferred to the adult system, so not ones that are automatically excluded, has also similarly fallen, and that goes back to what I was saying. Um, as the approach to young people in the system has changed, many of those young people, people have bought into the, well, brought into the research basically that says children are best served in their communities with their families from a, a developmental approach that engages families in the solutions. So um, with that practice, we've also seen youth crime continue to fall. Excellent. Excellent. So you can decarcerate. Mm -hmm. You can keep kids in their communities and crime can fall at the same time. We can hold those two truths as reality. <laughs> right. Right. With the Raise the Age uh, initiatives, um, state by state, would you say that overall, um, a major do a majority of states in the U.S., um, are they all at 18 or above 18? Um, yes. Thanks for asking that point of clarity. Um, so when we opened about, a, it was um, nearly a third of states did not have 18 as their number. There was 14 states that said it lower than 18. We're now down to three. Wow. So that's a huge, huge win, right? So, um, so we've got Georgia, Texas, and Wisconsin left. Um, we think that's about 30 to 33,000 kids a year. Um, seven, there, there are only 17 year olds. Uh, the vast majority of whom should be, would be served if they raise the age by the juvenile justice system. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's incredible. Well, that's, mm -hmm. that is quite a feat that you guys, I mean, what progress you've made. Uh, in yeah. Years. yeah, and the other thing, just to build on that, there's also been transfer reform in almost half of the states. So 24 states have changed their laws, making it harder to transfer kids automatically into the adult system. So that also narrows, you know, another bucket of young people that frankly raise the age doesn't oftentimes touch those kids. If a, um, states have so many different ways that they can transfer a young person into the adult system. One of the shortcomings of raising the age has been that it still carves out kids with more serious charges. Mm -hmm. um, and there's still ways for those kids to get to the adult system. But generally what we've seen happen, and the Justice Policy Institute wrote a really good piece on this, um, talking about what happened after states, the first round of states raised the age, they generally went back and said, we're transferring too many kids. And they narrowed that transfer statute as well. Um, and we've seen, we've seen six states now that actually have removed one of the vehicles to get kids in the, into the adult system entirely. So that's, that's really big progress from where we were in the 1990s. That's amazing. That's fantastic. Yeah. Skinhead, deadhead, everybody gone bad. Situation, aggravation, everybody allegation. In the suit, on the news, everybody dog. Bang, bang, shot dead, everybody gone bad. <laughs>